10 years ago, I was a television producer living in Manhattan. I was paying an exorbitant rent for a tiny apartment and living a very stressful life. I remember walking down Broadway one day and saying to myself, why do people live like this if they don't have to? I think what I was really doing is asking myself, why am I living like this if I don't have to? Looking back, I realized that I was an early brain drainer. After college, I left my small town Ohio roots and never looked back for almost 30 years. Like a lot of young people, I wanted to be in the center of things. Graduate school took me to Boston and then to a career in politics and eventually to television where I was a writer, producer, director for almost 20 years. I loved television. I had a great time. Starting in news and then getting to television programming. I worked for national cable networks mostly, like VH1, HGTV, and Lifetime. Th this career gave me a lot of great opportunities, like interviewing Bill Clinton in the White House, meeting Nelson Mandela, and working with a lot of artists and celebrities. But it also turned me into an American gypsy. Over the next 20 years, I lived in eight American cities, including Columbus, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Each time, I thought I had found a new home. I would rent an apartment, register to vote, uh, register my car, and look for things to expand my life beyond work. I would find a church, cl clubs to join, and men to date. But each time, a new opportunity would move me along before I connected with the place I thought was my new home. One of the constants in my life, my nomadic life at that time, were my trips to Cleveland, where my twin sister had moved in 1983. Being single, family events and holiday, holidays brought me back here. As time passed, I started thinking Cleveland, a city off the glamour grid, offered things that, my, that were missing in my life. As I was speeding off to the next adventure, my sister was settling into a successful law career and raising three beautiful boys. As I was looking for things to do and people to connect to, my sister was leading organizations that were providing shelter to the homeless and building a theater for kids with no place to go. When I got to New York City, I remember visiting my sister and saying, I think Cleveland feels like a resort, and I meant it. <laughs> with its emerald necklace of metro parks where you can play golf for less than 20 bucks, its lovely neighborhoods with beautiful homes at low prices, a, a lake you can't see across, and world-class arts, music, culture, theater, and sports. All these things made sense to me that Cleveland really offered so much more if what you were looking for was more than the splash and glitz of life as portrayed on TV. It was the tragic events of the World Trade Center in 9-11 that was the jolt of reality that knocked me off my TV producer merry-go-round and to a more meaningful life in Cleveland. Um, those events did a lot more damage than just to the real estate and the countless lives that day. It also really affected the advertising and television industries. I found myself without a job when the production company I was with went out of business. When my sister suggested that I go to law school at the age of 50, I thought she was crazy. But I realized it was my ticket to a more meaningful life in Cleveland. Law school was a challenge, but one I was up to. Once getting the insight of how legal and financial systems work, it led me to the Gordon Square Arts District, where I was fortunate to be the executive director for almost seven years, and then to Global Cleveland just three months ago. Both of these civic, nonprofit economic development initiatives were created to address problems. Both are remaking Cleveland by focusing on its authenticity, authenticity as a great place to live and work. The problem the Gordon Square Arts District addressed was a strip on Detroit Avenue that was like a, a no man's land between West 54th and West 78th Streets. With, it, with its boarded up shops and crime, few people were going there except for the, some brave patrons of the Cleveland Public Theater. In the 1920s, it had been a roaring um, arts district. 
but by the 1990s, the average sale price of a home there was just $16,000. Today, the Gordon Square Arts District is known as a destination in the region and also internationally, a destination for the arts, entertainment, dining, and a great place to live. It's attracted over $400 million of investment and 75 new businesses, and it's also the hot, one of the hottest places in the city to live. The change resulted from collaboration, a collaboration of three humble nonprofits working with civic leaders to expand, the, expand parking, improve the streetscape, renovate two century-old theaters, and build a third. This collaboration worked because the renovations were organic and they were neighborhood-centered. It wasn't glitzy and splashy, and the place had and still has the feel of an authentic, unique part of Cleveland. The Gordon Square Arts District got a great tribute in 2011 when The Economist did a story comparing three places that were creating arts districts. The international publication compared Gordon Square favorably to those two cities. It said that they were creating gigantic monuments to modernity instead of culture districts with the glue of wandering pedestrians. It said the Gordon Square Arts District has essentially applied economic shock paddles to an entire area weaving economic development into the neighborhood. The Gordon Square Arts District is an example of the creative class theory of economic development, that you attract people by creating an effective people climate, attracting especially creative people. That theory replaced the old theory that you throw millions of dollars building uh, big box retailers, downtown malls, and extravagant stadiums replacing authentic old neighborhoods with replicas, basically facsimiles of retail districts. Sound familiar? Well, in their new book, Rust Belt Chic, Richie Pepernan and Ann Trubeck are advancing a new theory of economic development, one based on authenticity. They say America is in the grip of a budding roots movement. Desires for the splashy are giving way to a longing for the past. The Rust Belt lacks illusions and is full of real people. And that is becoming attractive to folks, be they ex expats from Florida or young creative types tired of the bells and whistles of the Global City USA. That term Global City USA really resonated with me when I read it, because I think that's really where I was living when I was in Los Angeles and New York and Philadelphia and Chicago. These places all had their own distinct climates and attractions, but in essence, for me, they were all part of the same place, cookie-cutter replicas of each other with the same kind of national chain stores and restaurants and Starbucks that all felt and alike. In the global city, I didn't feel connected. I was really living on the surface like a tourist. I realize now that my journey has been one for a longing for connection and attachment to a place where I could make a difference, a place like Cleveland. Global Cleveland was founded to address the problem of population decline. The 2010 census was a real wake-up call. For the first time since the 1900s, the population of Cleveland had dropped below 400,000. Fueled by an influx of immigrants, Cleveland was once the fifth largest city in the United States and it had a population of over 900,000 in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. But by 2010, it had dropped to 396,000. But there's good news on the horizon. According to the state's figures, Northeast Ohio posted over 86,000 jobs October to November of last year. That's 7,000 more than the year before. There's $2 billion of tourism development going on in downtown Cleveland. Young people are flocking to downtown apartments and condos, and like it or not, the shale extraction business is pumping millions, if not billions, into our economy. But all of this new investment and economic momentum are threatened by a lack of population growth and qualified workers to fill the thousands of open positions. Recognizing that, the civic, corporate, and philanthropic leaders of Cleveland founded Global Cleveland in 2011. Its mission is to increase the population of Cleveland and strengthen the region by working 
with employers, colleges and universities, and service organizations to attract and retain newcomers by connecting them to the region's opportunities and to promote the region as a welcoming place for all. But how do you do that? How do you attract people to Cleveland? Many cities like Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Detroit, are all trying to answer the same question with their own welcoming centers and global initiatives. My vision starts with one word, and that is connect. First, we have to connect with people who aren't here to let them know what we're offering. And in my mind, what we are offering is the authentic American dream, a beautiful place to live with world-class amenities that's easy to get around at an affordable price. Online is the only way I know how to do it. That's why Global Cleveland is in the process of building the most robust, user-friendly information exchange platform that will answer all the questions that somebody might have about why should I move to Cleveland and what will be there when I get here. Answers to what job can I have? What are our communities like? What are the educational opportunities? Once we have that online tool, we're going to take it on the road to places like Washington, Boston, New York, and Chicago. And we're going to give it to people to let them know, to hopefully connect with them and convince them to boomerang back to Cleveland, if they were from here originally, or to come and give Cleveland a look. Now, there are two reasons why people move, jobs and friends and family. On the jobs front, Cleveland is working with employers and educators to create a pipeline between job seekers and the open positions that we have. On the friends and family front, we're relying on word of mouth, and that's why we're, we have launched a Latino initiative, an Asian initiative, and working with the 117 different ethnic communities in Cleveland to encourage them to tell their friends and family abroad and in this country that Cleveland wants them here. We're also working on immigration reform because we know that immigrants create jobs, they don't take them. That 40% of the Fortune 500 companies in this country were formed by immigrants and their or their children. We want that kind of innovation here. The region's motto is we make things. Immigrants came here to make things from the rich resources of our area. This region was built by immigrants who founded Cleveland on a strong foundation of business, finance, and manufacturing. But they also invested in the arts, and that's why 100 years later, Cleveland is one of the most vibrant art scenes in America. We have a great product to sell. Cleveland, the authentic American city. It's unique, it may have some rust on it, but rust forms on something strong and durable. Cleveland, a great place where you can live a rich life, make things happen, and be connected.